Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're gonna to be starting our instructional series on Aeon Trustpass Odyssey. This is a massive game with so much going on and it is incredible. And I'm very excited to be bringing this to you. Now, before we get into our first part of this instructional series, I wanna mention our sponsor, StoneValleyGames.com. This is your friendly, distant game store run by Eric and Wendy. They have so many great things going on over there. A ton of great games, the old classics, the new hotness, the new classics, the old hotness, all that stuff's over there. Go check them out. They also have a loyalty program for return customers. And if you are in the U.S. military and you're stationed overseas with an AA, AE, or AP address, they'll ship to you for free. On top of that, if you live in the continental United States and you order $100 or more of product for them, they will ship to you for free as well. Be sure to go check them out. There's a link in the description below. Aeon Trespass Odyssey is a one to four player campaign game about adventures, exploration, and fierce battles with giant primordial monsters. It's a cooperative, choice-driven board game experience played over multiple sessions. Set in an alternate antiquity where a reality-shattering cataclysm killed the Olympian gods and unleashed the otherworldly primordials, Aeon Trespass Odyssey places the players in the roles of Argonauts, the only people who can control the Titans, fight off the darkness, and make things right. Now, this video series will be teaching the rules directly from the rulebook. While you certainly are able to learn the game this way, I also recommend that you play through the Learn to Play Guide. Playing through this prior to learning the rules in full will give you a good foundation on which you can then build the rest of this rule set. Now my video series will be broken into six parts. Part one, this video, will cover the basics. Part two will cover the rules for the voyage phase. Part three, the adventure phase. Part four will teach you how to set up a battle as well as the primordial round of the battle. Part five, which will likely be the longest video in the series, will teach you the Titan round of a battle. And then part six, we'll wrap everything up by discussing gear, terrain, and ability keywords. Now, there are a number of secret envelopes included in the game. It's important that you do not open these until instructed to do so. When it's time to open one, the instructions will be very clear. Now, let's discuss some important rules concepts that you should keep in mind throughout the course of your plays of Aeon Trespass Odyssey. In the case of a rules conflict, Cards and sheets will always take precedence over the books. Cycle-specific rules found in the front of your cycle books, such as these first two pages, will take precedence over the rule book. And any rules that are very specific in nature will take precedence over rules that are more general in nature. Game elements can include all physical components of the game as well as story passages and notes, found in here. There are three phases in the game, the adventure phase, the battle phase, and the voyage phase. If you're not in the adventure phase or the battle phase, you're in the voyage phase no matter what you're actually doing. If an effect includes the word immediately, it must be resolved the moment it is triggered and takes precedence over other lingering effects as well as overruling any conflicting rules. So while this top part says you may immediately move up to four spaces, and that may provides the player with some leeway as to whether or not to do it, down here, if you have the knockdown, falling down condition card, immediately stand up and gain one positive evasion token instead. This portion immediately must be resolved. Many game effects will instruct you to ignore or disable other rules, effects, or game elements. When you are instructed to ignore something, you simply do not resolve any of its effects. Some ignore, effect, some ignore effects must be activated, in which case it affects only a specific instance. If the ignore effect is passive, as this one is, then the game element it refers to is ignored whenever the ignored effect is triggered. In this case, you can ignore labyrinth tiles for the purposes of voluntary movement and attacks. Some cards may actually say disable rather than ignore, in which case that completely deactivates a rule, effect, or game element. And all Titans, as well as the Primordial, will ignore this effect. The keyword instead always implies that the corresponding effect is resolved in place of a different effect. 
If the effect resolved instead is an improved or otherwise modified variant of another effect, it replaces only that effect. So for instance, if you had something that said that this weapon would have carving two instead, then that would mean that the carving one is replaced with carving two, but the rest of this effect is still there and would still be able to be resolved. Another example of how instead might be used is it might say when you are about to die from an instant death effect, resolve an obel draw instead. And so if this Titan were going to die from that instant death, instead of dying from that, they would be able to draw an obel card. And hopefully, if an effect includes the word may, as you see here, look at the top cards of the body part and AI decks, you may put each card back on top of its respective deck or onto the respective discard pile. This indicates that it is not mandatory and you can choose not to resolve it. So you may put it on top or you may put it in the discard pile. So in this case, it's giving you a choice of which one to do. It should be noted that all effects that do not include the word may must be resolved to their full extent if possible each time they are triggered. Keep in mind that if more than one effect is triggered at the same time, the players can choose the order in which these effects are resolved. And if any of these effects invalidate the conditions triggering another pending effect, that effect is no longer resolved. So for instance, if you're using the Earthshaker Titan and you have this cold open ability, this allows you to place one opening and one break token in the Kratos pool if you're attacking a primordial while the pool is empty. If you also had a Nemos card that granted minus one fate when attacking while the Kratos pool was empty, you could decide to resolve the Nemos card first and then place these tokens in the Kratos pool. Therefore, you would get the positive effects from both. However, if for some reason you placed these in the Kratos pool prior to resolving the Nemos card, you would no longer be able to resolve that Nemos card because these would then be in the Kratos pool and it would no longer be empty. Aeon Trespass Odyssey uses two types of dice. These D10 have all the normal numbers on them except for the 10 is replaced by this symbol, which is a progress symbol. D10 are used for attack rolls, evasion rolls, tests, and other miscellaneous rolls. A natural 10 will always be a successful roll or successful hit if you're attacking, while a natural 1 will always be a failure or a failed hit if you're attacking. It's important to keep in mind that the D10s are not limited by the supply included in the game. If you would ever be required to roll more D10 than provided, just substitute them with regular D10 dice or re-roll them as many times as necessary while making sure to note your previous results. The other type of dice are these D6. The D6 included in the game have these power symbols here, these potential symbols here, and this dot that we don't really know what it is when we start the game. Also, as you can see, they come in three different colors, red, black, and white, each of which has a different spread of the three different symbols. It's important to realize that these dice are limited by the supply. Many effects after you roll dice will allow you to re-roll those dice if you're not satisfied with the results. These effects are always referred to as re-rolls. During a single roll, each die can only be re-rolled once and you must declare all dice you wish to re-roll before you perform any of these rolls. So even if you had two different effects that would let you re-roll, you couldn't use one effect to re-roll this and then say, whoops, I got the exact same thing, so I'm gonna use my second effect to re-roll it again. Instead, you would have to decide, all right, well, I'm gonna re-roll two dice, so we'll re-roll both of these, roll it, and now you're stuck with whatever you got. If multiple players are going to perform their roles at the same time, which can happen when players are taking tests and stuff like that, they must all declare whether they want to re-roll any of those dice before any of them perform a re-roll. The most common way to gain a re-roll is by gaining fate. To do this, you must gain one fate for each die you want to re-roll. So if I want to get all three of them, I'd have to get three fate. And there we go. That probably was a waste. Fate can be used to re-roll attack rolls, evasion rolls, and tests. 
It cannot be used to reroll power rolls, armor rolls, and any other roll not specifically mentioned. If the test being rerolled is an Argo test, then you would actually need to gain Argo Fate rather than Fate Tracked on the Triskelion. If you're ever asked to choose a random Argonaut, roll a d10 for each one, and whoever rolls the lowest is the randomly chosen Argonaut. If you're ever asked to choose a random direction, draw the top card of the Minor Trauma deck, take a look at the arrow in the bottom left corner, and that's the direction chosen. If it shows this U-turn symbol here, then the player gets to choose the direction. The drawn card is then placed on the bottom of the deck. When told to draw a random card, just simply draw the top card of the indicated face down deck. And if those cards don't form a deck, then shuffle them all together and draw one without looking. And for any other game elements not mentioned, just roll the D10 again and whichever one gets the lowest number is the chosen random element. There are a number of secret decks in the game. This is just two of them. Secret decks are always designated with two divider cards, one on the front, which is labeled reveal here at the bottom, and one on the back, which is labeled back. When you're asked to draw from a secret deck, start by just revealing the bottom so that you can see its designation down here, including its ID number. This will help minimize spoilers. The Argo is the giant mysterious city ship that you will use to move around Hellas. The Argo holds many secrets, some of which will be revealed during the main story, while others are restricted to Inward Odyssey progress, and some of its secrets are hidden even deeper still. In the game, the Argo is represented by this mini. This mini will always be on a map tile throughout the game. This is the Argo sheet, and as you can see, it's the Argo sheet for Cycle 1. Whenever you gain or lose any of the stats listed, you should adjust their value in the corresponding section of the Argo sheet. You can find copies of this within the books included in the game, or you can go to the Into the Unknown Studios website and download and print copies from there. The timeline serves to organize your campaign, giving it a definitive beginning, middle, and end. Game time is measured in days, and each day is a campaign round. The timeline also has some fixed events on here, as you can see, while other events will be added by the players. To succeed in the campaign, you will be required to complete various tasks designated by story cards. Many of them will require you to collect progress, represented by these tokens. For each progress you gain, you must place one progress token on your current story card or the Inward Odyssey card. Progress is primarily gained by exploring the map and resolving adventures. Doom is the opposite of progress. For each Doom you gain, place one of these tokens on your current Doom card. These cards represent the encroachment of evil forces. Reaching the end of the last Doom card will lead to your failure. So let's take a closer look at a few of the key statistics that are particularly important on the Argo sheet. The hull, the crew, Argo fate, and Argo knowledge. Your crew represents the strength of the able-bodied members of the Argo's crew. A high crew value, meaning five, six, that area, means the city ship is fully staffed. A low crew value means it's run by a skeleton crew. Losing too much crew can lead to the campaign loss. Your hull represents the integrity of the Argo's hull. A high hull value means the city ship is running at full capacity, while a low value means it's close to sinking. Losing too much hull will lead to a campaign loss. Argo fate represents the collective destiny of the Argo and its crew. The more you try to bend the fates to your favor, the more resistance you're going to receive. Unlike hull and crew, a low Argo fate value means you're doing great, while a high value means you've pushed your luck too far and can expect a reckoning. Gaining over 9 Argo fate will lead, you guessed it, to a campaign loss. Argo knowledge represents the collective knowledge about the Argo itself and the state of the world. It's a cumulative stat that will only ever go up throughout the campaign. Argo knowledge is directly tied to your Inward Odyssey story card. 
Every time you gain an Argo Knowledge Point, you will trigger the next Inward Odyssey adventure. During each individual cycle, you can gain a max of 20 Argo Knowledge, with each of these tied to a unique adventure. When you finish one cycle and start the next one, you will skip any unresolved adventures and move on to the next Inward Odyssey card, so be sure to collect as much knowledge as possible. The player's ultimate goal is to reach the end of the current cycle's plot. This plot is represented by the cycle's story cards. As the story unfolds, your goals will become more clear. You only win, though, if a story paragraph explicitly says you've won. However, there are quite a few ways for the campaign to end in failure. If you resolve the last Doom card of the cycle, if the whole or crew reaches zero, if you gain more than nine Argo Fate, if you reach the end of the timeline, if a battle is initiated while you have zero Titans on board, and there are also other various narrative-related events that can end the campaign. Some of the conditions I just mentioned will lead you to a specific paragraph to read. For instance, if your hull reaches zero or less, you need to go read 0415. However, if you are not directed to a specific paragraph, instead see the campaign loss section of your current cycle book right here. In Aeon Trespass Odyssey, players take the roles of newly awakened Argonauts, the only people capable of controlling the mighty Titans. There will always be exactly four active Argonauts, no matter how many players take part in a campaign. If you play with a smaller group, distribute the Argonauts between the players as evenly as possible. The player controlling a given Argonaut always has the final say in all decisions regarding that Argonaut. Each Argonaut has their own Argonaut sheet, an Argonaut portrait card, and a Triskelion dial. There are no Argonaut minis. When they are initially awakened, the Argonauts are amnesiacs with no recollection of their prior life. However, during the game, they will gain Nemos cards, which will show them glimpses of their past. They may also gain Faded Nemos cards, which present specific traumas or vices. During battles, the players will use their Argonauts in conjunction with a Titan Sheet, and that Titan is represented by a Titan Mini. The Argonaut Sheet is used to track progress for a specific Argonaut. You can write your character's name here, which can be the one found on their portrait card, or you could create your own character name if you wanted to. You also can write the player who controls that character here. You'll keep track of the character's Nemos and Faded Nemos cards here, as well as skill bonuses, and note any other things such as abilities, boons, afflictions, and anything else that needs to be tracked. The Catharsis space is only used once you reach the end of a Nemos storyline. And this Triskelion space is only used when saving and packing up the game. While Titan death is common, Argonaut death is rare. However, it's not impossible. If an Argonaut does die, you'll need to find the Rude Awakening special event. So you go to your Cycles book, find the special events, page 83 in Cycle 1. So here we are, all of our special events, and you can see it's not here on this page, so let's flip, and here we go, Root Awakening on page 84. This will instruct you how to create a new Argonaut. It's important to remember that an Argonaut only dies when explicitly stated that they do, or if any of their Triskelion stats outside of battle increase above 9. Even when they die, though, do not discard or destroy their Argo sheet, as certain events might reference these sheets later. It's also possible that some story effects may cause an Argonaut to leave the Argo and retire. When this happens, take a new Argonaut sheet, draw a new portrait card, draw a new portrait card, and then draw a new Nemos card. It should also be noted that Technically speaking, instead of drawing a new portrait card, you could just choose a skill to give plus one to. Speaking of skills, each Argonaut has six skills. Courage, Cunning, Endurance, Fury, Will, and Wisdom. These will be used for various tests, both in adventures and battles. 
They all start with a plus zero modifier, meaning you neither add nor subtract anything to or from your roll, but you may go up or down as a result of other effects. The most common source of a skill boost is from the portrait card, in this case, plus one to endurance. Also, Nemos cards have skill boost at the bottom, so make sure to include those. It should be noted that you get these skill bonuses the moment you receive the Nemos card. The most common source of skill penalties is faded Nemos cards. The Triskelion is the heart of Aeon Trespass Odyssey and the key component of its inverted combat paradigm. It's a triple dial that represents the union of mortal, divine, and titan. Mortal, represented by danger, divine, represented by fate, and titan, represented by rage. These elements make the junction between the Argonauts and the Titans possible. Unlike the skills, these three stats are always in flux. They are mainly used in battles, but you may also use, gain, or lose these from various effects during adventures and other parts of the voyage phase. However, after a battle, the Triskelion stats are always reset to zero. Whenever you gain or lose any of these stats, you simply rotate the dial as appropriate. Each of these stats goes from zero all the way up to a maximum of nine. In general, you want them as high as possible without passing nine because that means you're using your potential to its fullest. However, the higher they are, the closer to despair, darkness, and death you are. Being forced to raise them over nine will always have dire consequences. During battle, it may lead to a titan death or other grim effect. Outside of battles, it will always lead to an Argonaut death. For that reason, you can never voluntarily gain any of these stats if it would take you over nine. Danger represents the rising threat of death. You gain danger when you are attacked and also through suffering other negative effects. However, it's not all bad as many gear cards and abilities actually improve with certain levels of danger. In battle, raising danger above 9 usually results in an obel draw, which, generally speaking, gives you a 50-50 shot of dying. Fate represents the extent to which you oppose your destiny. You can gain fate to re-roll your dice and to pay for certain powerful abilities. Be warned though, high fate may enable additional negative effects from primordial attacks. If you would ever raise your fate over 9 in battle, immediately draw a Moros card. Rage represents the fury of titans. It increases each time you attack and makes you more powerful by giving you access to additional abilities on the Kratos table. It also makes you more likely to become a target. Whenever your rage becomes higher than that of any other titan, you gain the priority target token. If you would ever have to raise your rage above 9 during battle, then your titan is consumed by rage and you lose control over it. Now let's discuss setting up your campaign. If this is your first campaign of Aeon Trust Best Odyssey, as previously mentioned, it's highly recommended that you play through the Learn to Play guide. However, if you've already played through it, or if you just don't want to, and now you wish to start a new cycle, follow these steps. Find and prepare the following elements from a cycle that you're about to play. Find all the map tiles for your cycle. Cycle one is brown, cycle two is red, and cycle three is purple. You'll need the Argo Mini, of course, the Exploration Deck, the clue cards for your cycle, the deck of Faded Nemos cards, and the cycle's Inward Odyssey Story card. Prepare the current cycle's Argo Sheet, which is different for each cycle, along with a Choice Matrix, which persists from cycle to cycle. You'll also need four Argonaut sheets. And then from there, you'll want to take a look at the inside of your cycle book and see the instructions for starting a campaign for that cycle. As already mentioned, Aeon Trespass Odyssey is played in a series of campaign rounds with each round representing one day on the timeline. Each day, you'll go through each of these nine steps, resolving them in order. Now, this sheet you're looking at right here, this campaign round summary sheet, does not come with a game, but it is 
highly recommend it. I strongly recommend you get this. It makes it so much easier to go through each step and make sure you don't miss anything without having to keep flipping back and forth in the book. I will have the link for this in the description below. It's made by a fan of the game over on Board Game Geek. Uh, go drop them some geek gold and download this. Uh, you, of course, can download it for free, but please give them some geek gold because this is amazing. This is version 1.4, and I believe it is the latest version. Uh, they haven't made any error adjustments since uh, maybe uh, it's been a couple of versions ago. Uh, the Since then, like 1.4 was just some added clarity by throwing, I think, some symbols in here and stuff like that. This is fantastic. Now, some of these nine steps will always require your action or decision, and others will be resolved only if the right conditions are met, and then some are entirely optional. So let's briefly go through these, and keep in mind in future videos, we'll be touching on all of these in detail. Movement is mandatory, and you have to move the Argo onto a different tile. Next is the timeline step, which is mandatory, and you'll advance the timeline by marking off the next empty box on the timeline. The third step is the exploration step. Exploration step is mandatory. You'll trigger any exploration symbols and then resolve an exploration draw. This could cause the adversary to move and then if necessary, you will also perform an acclimation. Next is the expedition step. If you're on an unexplored tile with an adventure or r, &R symbol, then you'll consult the adventure table and resolve an adventure. This is also one of the main ways you'll gain Nemos nodes and mark a faded box. Step five is the encounter step, which is conditional. If there are any timeline battles or battle events on the timeline, then you'll resolve them at this point. Step six is the advancement step, which is optional, and this lets you craft gear, resolve advancement events, develop new technology, and use existing technology. Step seven is the story step, which is conditional. If there are any story events on the timeline, you'll resolve it. If someone has an unresolved Nemo's breakthrough, you'll resolve it. Or if story progressions have been triggered, you'll resolve it. Step eight is the doom step, which is conditional. If there are any doom events on the timeline or the doom progression has been triggered, resolve it. And the ninth step is the end step, which is mandatory. If you are on an unexplored tile, it now is considered explored. After the end step, you'll proceed back to the first step again and begin a new campaign round. Continue resolving campaign rounds until the cycle ends with your victory or defeat. And that is everything for part one of our six part Aeon Trespass Odyssey instructional series. Be sure to come back, check out what we've got coming up in the near future. We've got more How to Play Frosthaven. We're going to complete How to Play Perdition's Mouth. We have, of course, more How to Play Aeon Trespass Odyssey. And coming up real soon is How to Play Keystone North America. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline. <laughs>